All right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And for those of us who are looking at us through online or streaming, welcome. We acknowledge you for taking your time to explore a conversation on this transformation of the struggle of love. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to say is just a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to introduce someone very special. As you can tell, I have a bit of an accent. Definitely it's not quite southern. I'm not quite from the north either. I was born in Colombia, and I also grew up in Belize, and I've been here for about 20 years, so a mixture of that is whatever I sound like, yeah? And I went to school, I had a traditional upbringing as well. I went to school and I have a bachelor's in international affairs. We did a concentration in international business, and then I got a master's in management and leadership. And then as I was growing in that world, I, I paid my way through school at the end of school by helping businesses grow. You know, I could have uh, worked for somebody or help people's businesses grow, and that really became a passion of mine. There is something really special about helping a business grow. It's like a lot of things happen, right? So in that journey, I eventually went to work for a very large corporation that does training and development, and I ended up consulting for them, and I eventually ended up uh, doing consulting in Africa, doing consulting in South America, and in the Caribbean, and also in North America. And I've had the chance to work with really large organizations with 20,000 people and getting teams to do high-performing, um, creating high-performing environments to helping people and just in the transition, just making a transition from being an employee and starting a business. And in that process, I started a consulting company and we also created a leadership course around that and we're gonna tell you a little bit about that later, yeah? And so I've been honored and privileged to be part of people creating a journey of never quite getting off the ground to making six figures and to be making seven figures. And that's one of my passions, right? So that's a little bit about myself. And as I keep going, maybe I'll share a few more stories. Now, I do want to introduce someone who is very, very special for me. And, it, and it's, this person is really special because it's actually someone who was a was a person who my life was one way and then I met him and my life became this way. And it, it's someone who has also gone through the journey of working for a company and then creating his own business and now he manages a multi-million dollar company that supports um, the infrastructures for Atlanta Gaslight in some, in some degree, yeah? And so, um, but most importantly is the person that I can give a credit to whatever my life has evolved and whatever contribution I can be for human beings. This is uh, the man who I'm about to introduce. So please welcome Sorel Jacatan. <laughs> Thank you, Sorel. <laughs> Thank you, Gio. <laughs> So, uh, you know, introductions are funny, aren't they? Somebody introduces you as Gio's introducing me. I'm saying, oh, he's talking about me, <laughs> right? So there's this thing about being a human being for me that's always uncomfortable when being acknowledged or being introduced. So I wanted to say that because mostly people don't speak that way. People don't acknowledge what they're dealing with internally with each other and to others. So I'm saying that right now to give you a sense of the kind of conversation you're engaging in. So my name is Sorel Ketan. I was born in Haiti. I left Haiti in 1977. If you weren't born before that year, raise your hand. There you go, we see them, we see them. We call them millennials, right? And uh, I, I've had the privilege of uh, living, really, right? So when I look back at my life, it's not like I've lived a successful life. I've lived. And part of my living happened in Haiti. As a little boy, I would look at my next door neighbor who had a car and my parents didn't and envy him. 
at one point in time, I was walking to school and I got to the main road. Now, when you get to the main road in Haiti, you catch this thing called a tap tap. It's a pickup truck. And on the back of the pickup truck, they weld two benches and they build a roof on the back of the bed. And people pile up in there. Whether you're sitting on the bench or standing in the middle or hanging off the back. I really enjoyed hanging off the back. <laughs> so, uh, you know, living in Haiti shaped me. It shaped me in a way where uh, for years I didn't say to people I was from Haiti. Because as a teenager, when I was in Miami, I landed in 1977 and the CDC published an article saying that AIDS originated from Haiti. And as a teenager, that just killed my world. None of the pretty girls in the neighborhood wanted to be with me. <laughs> I was contaminated, I was tainted, right? And so as a human being, I built strategies for myself to actually survive life as a Haitian. Now, I'm speaking that to you because I can speak that powerfully now. It has no impact on me. My mother's Haitian too. My father's Haitian too. They don't speak a word of English. If they were here, they'd speak English to you, but you wouldn't understand a word they're saying. But I understand them. <laughs> and uh, so there is the accumulation of living as a Haitian. There's the accumulation of life of going to school. There's the accumulation of life of meeting my wife, Susan, and getting married. There's the accumulation of life of working 14 years for at and I'm a tech, I'm a geek, I love this stuff. And there's the accumulation of life of being married for 33 years with three young men, Marcel's 33, Marcus is 30, and Marlon's 21. My eldest, who's 33, is married. He's got two children. My grandkids are 13 and 10. And with all that, I had the privilege of meeting Giovanni at an organization where I led seminars. And uh, I did that for over, what's that, 15 years? Over 15 years. So I'm saying all that to let you know that with Giovanni and I, you're in really good hands, right? Not that we know something, but that we've lived and we've spent a majority of our lives living for something bigger than us. And that's something bigger sitting right here, right? You, you. You, you, every single one of you, right? So as Giovanni and I speak tonight, I'm asking you to act, act as if we're speaking to you directly. You know, we talked about the cliques earlier, right? There's this other thing called being in a group. When you're sitting in a group, you may be sitting there, right? And I'm saying something and you go, oh no, he's not talking to me. He's talking to the group. No, I'm talking to you. Every single word Giovanni says tonight, every single word I say tonight is meant just for you. Now you'll get what you get. And it's not my intention that you get anything because something is wrong with you. However, it is my intention that you get something because you're here. And you know what? I know that your being here says that you're up to something really big. Now, raise your hand if you're up to something really big. I'm going to pick on a couple of you. <laughs> so, Jardit, what is the something big you're up to? <laughs> and, and by the way, notice, just as I walked up, 
Giovanni was introducing me and it was uncomfortable for me. As I pick on you right now, it's uncomfortable for you. And I'm doing that purposefully, right? Because who we are as human beings is life's happening and I am threatened. And there's nothing happening. There's not a gun to my head, nothing. And I'm threatened. So you're discovering what it's like to be a human being and being threatened when nothing is threatening you. And I'm speaking to all of you, right? So what's the big thing you're up to? Now you can steal somebody else's big thing, okay? So somebody else, what's the big thing you're up to? I'll let you volunteer now. <laughs> yes, Eileen. Awesome. And that's really big for you, right? And are you afraid? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what it is to be a human being. So we're not here to create special people. Uh, Giovanni and I got in business together to give ordinary people like you, like me, the opportunity to live an extraordinary life. And what we've created together gives that opportunity. So at the end of the evening, you'll have an opportunity to actually consider and register yourself in that opportunity. And I'm standing here to tell you, grab that opportunity tonight. Because what will keep you from grabbing it is the very thing that you came here for. So I'm saying it this way because I'm very confident that what we're about to share with you and the conversation we're gonna share with you is going to create something for you that wasn't going to happen if you weren't here. And it's just a sliver, like a little slice. Gio, how much of a slice of the three-day course is tonight? Uh, it's difficult to say because I wanna answer it this way. You'll get the whole thing in about 2%. It's about that much, right? So we're going to go through what it's like to be an entrepreneur and still live your life. What it's like to be someone who works in a corporation, whatever your position is, and you're dealing with doing that job and still having your life. And we're going to interact together to uncover some of the problems that entrepreneurs and professionals must face to actually succeed and win the game of rising in a, in a corporation or winning the money game and the business game as an entrepreneur. But, and, and today's conversation is particularly con focused on your whether you see it or not, of what it takes to grow your relationship and grow your relationships while you're growing a business. So it has a, it has a filter about that, and that filter, you can use it for everything you do. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you, Gio. And then as I work with you and we interact to uncover the difficulties of being an entrepreneur and being a professional who's looking to grow, uh, Giovanni's gonna come up after me and share with you the solutions to those problems. And then we'll spend time covering in those 2% that Gio mentioned, the course itself. And then we'll give you an opportunity to consider being in the course. The course is happening March 27th, 28th, and 29th. So raise your hand if you are in business for yourself or considering that. All right, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. You know, some of them are going like that. I think I'm in business for myself. <laughs> right, so it goes like this. Raise your hand like this 
if you're in business for yourself, right? Okay, awesome. Now, keep your hands up. Now, raise your hand if you are considering owning your own business. Okay, keep your hands up. And now, raise your hand if you work in a corporation and you're committed to the success of that corporation. All right, that's about all of us, right? So, uh-huh. If you are in a relationship and you're committed for it to grow. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> raise your, no, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> raise your hand if you're in a relationship and your work or your business is actually creating some friction in that relationship. Okay? Now, raise your hand if you have a relationship and you're considering going into business and you're wondering what the impact will be on the relationship. Yep. So, the evening is about all of that. And uh, Giovanni and I were speaking earlier and we said, uh, ask them to participate. I'm asking you to participate because a whole bunch of what you'll get tonight will come out of the mouth of the person next to you. So never underestimate what you're contributing to the people sitting next to you. So, Gio, do I press up or down? Oh, let's try it this way. Eh? Down, I'll remember. <laughs> so, uh, being in a relationship and actually running a thriving business or being in a relationship and actually being a successful professional in a corporation or wherever you are takes something. And there are some challenges to actually doing that successfully while keeping the relationships that matter to you intact, growing, and thriving. So here are some of the challenges. Aha. Uh -huh. You can read the first one. You're going to change to the, to the other presentation? Yeah. Okay, good. So the challenges go like this. You may be in a business, but your family members, your spouse, your friends, actually have to compete with your business or your job for your time, your love, and your attention. Now, back in 1992, I moved to Birmingham, Alabama. I had the opportunity of going to work for AT&T uh, for a techie. That was like a dream come true. I moved to a place, five city blocks, nothing but computers. We had mimicked the entire network for telecommunications in that building. And my job was to develop applications, software, and test them, and then deploy them to the market. And we were developing caller ID. And so, uh, and I remember staying at work from 8 a.m. to midnight for a stretch of time that seemed to be, my God, for my wife, Susan, it's, it must have been like 10 years. But for me, it was like that. And when Susan would talk to me, she'd say, well, you know, how about spending some time with me? How about spending some time with the children? I would go straight to, but you don't understand. For me to succeed, I actually have to work that hard. I actually have to work that way. So, in business, often it is, do I run a business, do I work in a corporation, or do I have a life? I was operating in the space where it was either or, not both. This conversation is about you creating, having both. How many of you can relate to this definition of having a balanced life, where you evenly distribute your love, your time, and your attention to your family, your friends, yourself, and also your business and your job. 
How many of you would actually say balance is that? Raise your hand if you say balance is that. That's the world of either or. Because that actually never happens in life. Nobody ever evenly distribute their time, their love, across the things that matter to them and the things that they love. Now, I'm asking you to consider a new view of what a balanced life could look like. Actually, a fulfilled life. What if this was balance? On the one hand, you have everything you love, everything you want in your life. And on the other side, everything else. And none of everything else matters. Now, what you'll see as we move forward, you'll see that often the everything that you want and love in your life, what actually keeps us from having that is that we've never said what we want and love in our lives and stand for it. We let everything else take our lives over. So we won't dig into this conversation anymore, but what you're looking at is access to a pathway to both, having everything in your life. How many of you would love to have that kind of life? I'm looking for the ones who are not raising their hands because they're asleep or dead. <laughs> How many of you would love to have that kind of life where you have everything you want and everything you love in your life and there's no longer this tug of war between your time shared between what you're up to in your life and business and what you want to do for your family, your friends, and yourself. And here are the challenges to actually achieving that. Your partner or your spouse must compete with your business for your time, love, and attention, and you see no pathway to a partnership for the business, whether your partner or your spouse works in the business or not. Now, whether you're working in a corporation or not, I want you to pause for a moment and see where that particular kind of challenge is present in your life. Take a moment and look. And then that moment is gone. Now I'd love for one of you to raise your hand and share with me where you see that particular challenge at play in your life. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example, sorry. Yeah. As, I was, I was, as I was looking at that, I was thinking, so how does that look in my life? And it looks a little bit like this, honey, on Saturday, I got an appointment at 9. And she says, really? Saturday at 9? What about this plan we had? Or what about that plan we had? Or really, do you need to do that on Saturdays? That's what it looks like in your life. Or that's what it looks like on my life. Anyone can relate to that? Even coming here? Really? 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 Yeah, very good. Now, Gio gave you a gimme, right? Like he's prompting you, saying, hey, come on, say something, right? So I'm, I'm insisting, one of you, relate it to your life. My commitment is that you walk out of here with a relationship to the challenges that actually has you confront them. So, who wants to say something about that particular aspect of the challenge in your life? Fabiola? Uh, like for me, it's uh, my relationship with my kids. Uh -huh. um, a lot of time, I, especially when I have to do, I'm, I'm into catering where I create stuff, um, beautiful table arrangements. But a lot of times the kids are in the way out. They want me to come and play. Mommy, play hide and seek with me. 
me money. Dude. I'm like, no, mommy needs to do this because I need to make money. And they feel like, mommy, you don't spend time with me. And you're like, okay, I'm trying to build my business to make it grow and do a beautiful job. But I'm kind of neglecting my kids because usually I do it on a Saturday. And that's when they're not going to school. That's when I'm supposed to be spending time with them. So I have that conflict. I'm trying to work on something. When I'm tired, I still try to play with them, but not that I want to because I'm so tired of everything. And if you're a human being, that conflict is there all the time. And this conversation is how do you deal with that conflict, right? And the second challenge, in the absence of partnership, your relationship spirals into the pit of resignation. Like you get to a point where you go, oh, that's as good as it's gonna get. That's the way it is, and that's the life I live. Now, those you cherish the most are frustrated and they want out. Your spouse wants a divorce. That kind of relationship. Now, some of you may be on the other side of that challenge. How many of you are divorced or separated? That's that challenge. And the third one, you want to be vulnerable and communicate your fear and your passion for your business but you don't know how to. Remember the discomfort you felt earlier when you walked away from your clique? <laughs> that same discomfort comes up when it's time to actually share something that matters to you, even with the people closest to you. One of the things that was most difficult for me to share with my wife was the fact that I was the man of the house. And what I meant by that is that I grew up knowing and believing that the person who provides for the household is the man. And when it came time for a transition to happen in my company, in 2014, my wife joined the company and shortly thereafter became the CEO. Now guess who's working for my wife? <laughs> I am. I, it's like, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> and so to be vulnerable, to share with her that I was dealing with that, to share with her that it was just painful sometimes to actually watch her work while I'm doing something that I'm considering is not work. And translating that in my head as in, oh, now she's the breadwinner. And then translating that to mean something about me, like I'm inadequate as a man. So that kind of vulnerability in a relationship to actually not only share that, but to share the passion. I actually got the courage at some point in time to say to Susan, you know, if money was no object, if I could live the life I want to live, guess what I would do? I'd be standing in front of a room every night having this conversation with you. And she looked at me and she goes, well, why don't you go do that? And that would have never happened. I would have stayed where I am as someone who's working really hard to be the provider someone who's working really hard to be the man of the house, someone who's working really hard to prove myself to the other men in my life who see life that way. All the while, missing out on what I'm really passionate about. So that problem right there, vulnerability and communication, Gio's going to touch on how do you actually overcome that and get past that barrier? And last but not least, you want to manage your time, yet you're stressed and dominated by your commitment. How many of you have ever made a commitment, whether in business or in life, and you go, why on earth did I ever say that? <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> That's what it looks like when you're being dominated by a commitment you make. And the stress that comes up with it, in that moment, now, let's play a game, right? You, you said you'd do something. 
You're committed to it, right? And then you go, why on earth did I ever do that? Now, what's the feeling that's right there in that moment? Fear, Fear right? What else? Huh? Regret. And then, as a human being, since I said yes, and I'm now no, but I'm pretending to still be yes, what must I do? Come on, you, you, you do it every day in your life. Oh, yes, you'll sacrifice, right? Suffer. suffer, oh yes. And guess what? You'll go tell people about your suffering. <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 I suffer better than most. <laughs> like that. So that's the nature of those challenges. And we're just covering a slice now. I'm pausing for a moment so you can be with that and identify for yourself the one that's predominant in your life as a professional or an entrepreneur. All right, that moment's expired. Raise your hand if you've identified yours. All right. And if you didn't raise your hand, does that mean you haven't identified one? You're afraid? I got it, right? That's what human beings do. So guess what though? All of these challenges have a direct impact on your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your colleagues, your relationship with your partners and, your, and the entrepreneurs in your life. Now you can take this to the bank. The quality of your life is directly correlated to the quality of your relationships. That's the one side, right? Here's the other side. The quality of your relationships is directly correlated to your ability to deal with these challenges and do so effectively. In life as an entrepreneur, you can be in the world of either or. You know, I'm gonna do my business. The relationship's gotten to a point where it's stable, which means we're both hopeless that it's ever gonna get better and we've now gotten used to it. This is not this conversation. This conversation is the conversation where you discover how to actually create a relationship that fulfills you, a life that fulfills you, all the while winning at the game of business. And Giovanni's done just that. He's married to a beautiful doctor named Manisha. They have a daughter named Maya. She's adorable. Giovanni and I are on calls every Sunday morning. And every now and then he'll go, Sorrel, give me, give me two minutes. I gotta do something to Maya, right? He's a loving father. And more importantly, he is someone who's committed to others. And how he actually creates his commitment for others is by discovering for himself those challenges in his life and then using the experience of his own life to be with you. So it's my honor and my privilege to introduce you again to those of you streaming. He's coming up again. Here's Giovanni Gonzalez to now start to open up the solutions to these challenges. Jill. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The clicker's right here, and it's the <clears throat> down button. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so great. Hi. Good to see you. So, that's, so that was great. Did you get a sense of the challenges that you are already dealing with? Or was it like informing you of something that you may bump, a, bump up against at some point in your life? What was it that like for you? Was it something you're already living with, something you're, you're dealing with, or was he informing you something that you're gonna deal with in your life later? Which one was it for you? Well, for me, on that last one, yeah. uh, I'm wanting to manage my time, create balance, but 
stressed and dominated by commitments. Um, so that wasn't a hypothetical. That wasn't a hypothetical. That was there for you. Yeah? Raise your hand if one of these three actually applies for you. If one of those. Like, like, look, right? Like, you gotta look. You know, when I look like, if you're in a relationship, your partner, spouse, your partner or spouse must compete with your business for your time, love, and attention. If you're in a relationship and you don't raise your hand to that, you're not here. You're just not present. You're like surviving this conversation, you know, like, Oh, what time does this end? Oh yeah, like 8.45, yeah, yeah. That's how you are here. I want you to consider that. You're not present, that's what it's like on the court in your life. It's more or less like this. Now, you know, I'm stretching the notion, but consider it for yourself. It's more, more or less like this. Um, no, that one doesn't apply to me. And then you get home, hi honey, where were you? What happened? What did you come so late for? What were you doing? And at that moment, you're like, yeah, that one applies to me. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you've got to allow yourself to be in this conversation in a way in which you're actually not, you're actually here, you're actually looking at in the absence of partnership, your relationships spiral into a pit of resignation. Does that communicate with you? Now, now this is not for all of us, but I'm going to say 98% of us who are in a relationship, at some point, being in a relationship, familiarity shows up. And we say things like, Oh, I know him. Or, oh, I know her. The moment you say, I know him or I know her, that shows up. It's just a few days away from showing up where I'm starting to look at, ah, this is the way that it is. And you kind of get resigned. Does that make sense? Yeah, are you in the conversation? Is this now starting to apply for you? Or not really? You're still surviving it? Like, what? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, one thing I have clear, the name of this, this conversation is The Transformation and the Struggle of Love for Entrepreneurs. So something about that must have made sense for you, right? Because it's pretty, it's, it's like filtering the opportunity of the conversation. So I want to make sure that you are allowing yourself to actually be in the conversation. So as I go through the opportunity of the solution for those challenges, you're actually really seeing them for yourself. Like, like you're like, when you go home, you're like, man, that was a profound conversation. That was not like a movie. That was like real. Yeah, makes sense? Yep, raise your hand if you're here. Yeah, very good. Some of you didn't raise your hand if you're not here. So this, you know, like allow yourself that the engagement I'm trying to create, that you allow yourself to be, use you. All right, so here's a, chat, here's a question for you. And, uh, and this is an important question to start the whole conversation, right? When you're in a relationship, right? And raise your hand if you're in a relationship. Yep. Raise your hand if you're single. Single people. All right, look at the other single people. <laughs> right, there you are. Yeah, good, good, yeah, things happen. So, this also applies to the single people, yeah? What percentage of what it takes to have your relationship work should you be responsible for? Right, that's like, what percentage of what it takes to have your relationship work, my relationship work, should I be responsible for? Hmm, that's a question. You know, allow yourself to be with the question. Really, look at your relationship. Don't just give an answer, like, look. How much are you willing to give? 
to make it work? Like, look. Don't say the right answer. Look. And then, what percentage of what it takes to have your relationship work should your partner be responsible for? Like zero, you say. What else? 100. Yeah, I mean, my partner's got to have 100% percentage of this thing. Fifty? Yeah. I say 100 for both. Anybody has something else different? What's that? I have no control of what they bring. Got that? Anybody else has a new one? A different one? Nobody has 90, 10, 80, 20? No, just 100% for both, no control over it, zero my partner. You said zero in my partner, right? Yes? How much for you? 100%. Now, the answer that we're looking for is that one. I'm 100% responsible for my relationship, and she is 0%. Could you, uh, could you play that game? Yeah, thank you for saying no. Because although that's the answer you know we're playing with, when I'm in my relationship, I don't play that game. And I want you to see, I want you to notice how trapped I am when I don't play that game. You know, when I play the game 100, 100, then I really don't really have ultimate power because I'm listening for 100 for the other person. And if I do 90, 10, 90% me, 10% you, I'm still listening for that 10%. Did you deliver on that 10%? You didn't deliver on that 10%? Then, then I'm not going to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In my mind, that's created when I say, oh, I'm responsible for everything and anything, I give 100%, and there's that little voice that says, you can't give me 100%, don't you see you can take that advantage off? You don't just stop it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's perfect. That's really great. And it's like, what, what I like about what you're saying is that you're actually looking. Yeah, like I'm giving 100% and I keep giving 100% and I keep giving 100% and I went to see Gio and, Gio and Sorel and he said 100% and I, he keeps taking advantage of me. Yeah, there is, you know, there's something now to look at in that 100% that you're not being responsible for the quality of your life. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you keep doing something, something, that doesn't mean you're being 100% responsible for the quality of your life. You're actually not. That makes sense? Yeah, why, do, why does that make sense? The quality of my relationship with my partner is not only predicated on we're together. We being together. Perhaps being together is not being responsible for my relationship. If we keep acting like cats and dogs every single day, impacting my children every single day, where they are praying that their parents separate rather than the other way around, then I'm not being 100% for the relationship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not listening for something that she wants. Now I'm forcing my way through something. Make sense? Yeah. So, you know, you know I'm opening a can of worms, right? But I, I, it's, that's the opportunity because we are committed 
that you leave tonight with a clear pathway to have your relationship work as you grow your business, with a clear pathway. Make sense? So I got, I got to create the conversation with this kind of passion. So if you feel like I'm being a little bit over the top, forgive me. But I want to make sure that the engagement is happening. You want to add something? Yeah. This responsibility slide, Gio's going to move off it, right? It's not something for you to actually understand, like a concept. Like Giovanni said, oh, the right answer is 100% me and 0% the other person. That's not the idea. The idea is to actually get that if you are to address these problems, the challenges we talked about earlier, you're going to have to come face to face with who you are for yourself that's not being 100% responsible while your partner's zero. So this is not theory. It's not academic. It is your life. So bring your life to it, not just in your relationship, but also in your relationship in your businesses. All of it applies all across the board. Very good. Thank you, Sorel. Perfect. Now, the biggest destroyer of your, of your relationship is a specific banana. I want to explain what that means. Sorel and I lead a three-day three leadership course, and there's a moment where we explain one of the biggest challenges for human beings is to let go what we call their banana. And where that metaphor comes is from the way it is said, so we don't know, it is said that in the Amazon or in Africa, the way that they hunt monkeys is by putting a banana inside of a cage, and then the monkey goes and grabs the banana, and because it's inside of a cage, it's a little hole, as soon as they close the, ri the wrist, they can't get their hand out. So the hunter comes, and the monkey looks at the hunter and starts moving aggressively, trying to run away, and he just keeps doing it, but it never lets go of the banana. And so the hunter comes and whoosh, gets him. So human beings do that all the time in the context of their relationship and in the context of their business and in the context of their life. They don't let something go. And they just keep holding on to it and they keep holding on to it and they keep holding on to it and then they, they deal with the hunter, they deal with divorce, they deal with bankruptcy, they deal with losing a friendship, they deal with not talking to their parents, they deal with, they do it with a royal mess because they're unwilling to let go of a banana. Does that make sense? Can you see your banana? Some of you are gonna say, well, I can see the whole thing. I mean, like, there's like a lot of bananas right now. <laughs> there's a banana tree in front of me, right? Now, the metaphor is very powerful when you start seeing those areas of your life that are not working a place in your business that is not growing or a place in your relationship where it's not growing, you, you could see, man, what am I holding on to? What am I holding on to? I am going to tell you what you're holding on to. Now, what I'm about to say is not the truth, but I want you to hear it like if it was the truth. Like this applies to you. And I want you to play with it for the next 25 minutes or so. This is the truth about you. The biggest destroyer of your relationship is a specific banana, and that banana is being right. You gotta look. Think about a relationship right now that you care about that is not working. Not, you know, it's not, it's not working. Think about a relationship that you care about right now that is not working right now. Everybody has one? Yeah? Did you think of one? They're all working? Raise your hand if you have one relationship. Not that I'm going to ask you to share. I just want to know if you have them in your mind. Yeah, okay, you have one. Okay, perfect. Now, notice that you are right about something. You're right about something. Now, this is really difficult to see. 
Self-reflection is only for the wise one. This is really, really difficult to see. What are you being right about? Now, the one that is easy to see is what is what the other person right about. If you think about that relationship that's not working, or not working as well as you want to, you can see what that other person is being right about. Can you see it? Hello? It's so easy. Well, they don't want to say I'm sorry. Well, they don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. It's so easy to see it in them. But you're right about that. That's what you're right about. And I want you to know it has such an impact, such an impact in the quality of your relationship. Now, we like to say this. Dogs like to bark. Cow, not cow, cats like to meow. And human beings adore, love, they're addicted to being right. But you know, like addicted to being right. You're addicted to being right. You know that? You know you are addicted to being right? If you start saying no, there you are. <laughs> what is difficult to create in this hour conversation is the impact in your life by being right. That's difficult to create. But I'll give you an example in my life, right? So I didn't grow up with my parents. My mother was 16, my dad was 17. So I didn't really grow up with them. My mom lived with her parents. My dad was around with my, with my grandmother, but not quite living with them. So as I was growing up, I grew up with this kind of, I couldn't help it, my own humanity, kind of resentment about them. Like, you're supposed to be there. Like, hello, you're my parents. You're supposed to love each other. Hello, you're supposed to love me. You're supposed to be around. I don't want to be your child anymore. I want to be your friend. So I kind of grew up like that. And to make this story short, by the time I was 21, 22, I wasn't talking to them. I wouldn't talk to them. I wouldn't care. I went through whatever troubles I went through when I moved to the States. Wouldn't call them. I could be hungry. Couldn't care. Because I was right about that. I was right. So I have no relationship with my parents, but I'm right. And I was right. You know what I was right about? I was right that they didn't really care about me. And I had all this evidence, and I put all this season around it, and I have so many occasions that I built up in my mind to be right about it, and I didn't have a relationship with them. Can you see the power of being right? Now, it makes no difference that I tell you my story. you got to look at yours. So I go through a conversation like this, and I'm unwilling to look that I'm, maybe, I'm, you know, I'm being right about this. This is not being right. This is the truth. You know, big difference, right? At the time for me. This is not me being right. I'm telling you the truth. Hello? They weren't there. Hello? These are the facts. And the more I got into that rabbit hole, the more righteous I was. And then I have no relationship with my mother. And she's alive and kicking. And I am living my life like she doesn't care about me. And righteous. You got to see yourself in the conversation. Look where you do that and the impact of that in your life. So I go through a conversation like this, and this is the reason why I lead courses like this. Because the strangers, like I am to you, are, are willing to turn themselves up and, up and down, upside down, to get a point across to someone who is cynical and resigned like I was. And I noticed that I was being right about it. That it wasn't the truth. None of it was true. I was just right about it. And so I, I was able to let it go, and then I went to, created a conversation with my mother about my, the way I was, I had, the way I had, Con make the, the kind of conclusions I made about her, my upbringing, and she got to say whatever she had to say, and we had a relationship, right? 
and we just like talk every weekend, every weekend, and however it is that we develop our relationship. She lives in New Jersey. And when I moved to the States, right? She moved to the States from Colombia so she can work as a, someone who cleans houses so she can help me pay for school. And she has two degrees and stuff, but she wanted to make sure that I went to school. The person who my whole life I was saying she didn't care about me. A lot of BS we do about being right, right? But so you gotta see your story, right? And you gotta see the impact and you gotta allow for letting it go. So here's the choice that we ask you to play, to take on. You can either be right or you can have love, but you can't have both. You can either be right or you can have love but you can't have both. Now, if you're actually present to this, it should get in under your skin. Because when I saw that for the first time, I didn't like it. Because I like being right. You know, with Manisha, you know, we, have a, we have a great relationship, and every now and then we don't. And every time we don't, it has something to do with me. I promise you. And every time she ever says, well, you know, you can be right or you can, or we can have love, but we can have both, I can look. I can see, yep, I'm being righteous about something. So which one matters to you? Being right or love? Which one matters? <laughs> now, we laughed when he said being right matters to him. That was a laughter of recognition because to be human is to love being right. And to be what matters to me is being right while pretending that's not the case. Yes. No, no, I love, I love the authenticity, right? Everybody can recognize that. Now we gotta deal with the impact, right? After the laughter. You've got to allow for the actual impact, which is, yeah, being right matters, but the impact of being right sucks. You've got to allow yourself to be impacted by it so you can start creating new associations so that your life takes a turn. It's, there, you know, I heard this from a mentor before. I don't know. There is no such a thing as the lowest place in your life. You can always go lower. <laughs> and you know when you stop going low? When it stinks for you. If it doesn't sting for you, you can still go lower and go lower and go lower and go lower. So here's the, the big thing is this, right? The quality of your life is directly correlated to the quality of your relationships. This is, my, this is my experience, Gabby. This is my experience in my life, right? And I am just as righteous as anybody else, yeah? I don't want to sell myself as some Eckhart Tolle guy who has wisdom. No, I'm a human being that has tools to reinvent himself. That's what I have, right? So I'm just as a jerk as anybody else. But let me tell you something I know from experience. When I let go of being right, it creates a space for them to also let it go. I've, I've, no, I've noticed it almost all the time. I just need to give them a little bit of a break because they're still dealing with the emotion of my righteousness. So I may be thinking that I'm keeping up, but there's a, With all these yeah, conditions. There's a, exactly, there's a blind spot. There's something I'm not taking. 
or you have all these conditions. I'm giving you love. Don't you see I do this and 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 I do this. Why can't you just appreciate me? And they're like, what? They're dealing with that. You want to add something? Um, this, this being right thing is so subtle. It's like you'll give up being right just so you can be right that they're being right. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. I, I thought I could hold being right and I chose love, but I never really chose love because I was trying to be right about not being right. Could be, right? Could be. You just gotta look. You gotta stay in that process and you gotta map this conversation to your life, to what you are dealing with, to the arguments you have. You've gotta go there. This conversation is quite conceptual. And a conversation that is quite conceptual tends to be like cool, but doesn't make a difference. We're committed that it makes a difference to you, so you gotta take this to your life. Yeah? Now, here's another aspect that we wanna open up today. The quality of relationships are very much tied up with your past. Your past is a big aspect of it. And it's more than a bumper sticker. It's more than a bumper sticker. You gotta, like, that conversation of the past is, like, killed so much that we can't even hear it. This is, like, everywhere. So I want you to allow yourself to look at this conversation like you've never heard it before. Kind of like the sunset. You know, it happens every day, but every now and then you see it like you never saw it before and you're actually mesmerized by it. So I want you to look at this conversation like the first time. Your past runs your relationships. Now, for each of you, it's different. Sorel was pointing to it. When I was growing up, what did I hear about being a man? And he said, what did you say? Breadwinner, the man of the house, right? Now you men, you look, what did you hear? You look, right? And you women, you look. What did you hear? Right? Some of the things are, a woman is supposed to take care of the children. Some of you heard that, some of you didn't. It doesn't matter. But you heard it. A man is supposed to be the provider. Some of you heard, when you go up, don't let anybody tell you what to do. Some of you heard that. Anybody heard that? Raise your hand if you ever heard that. Yeah, it's very difficult to be in a relationship if you heard that. Because anything sounds like you're telling me what to do. Yep. <laughs> Don't trust anybody. Did you ever hear that? Don't trust anybody? Be suspicious. Don't trust anybody. Yep. Then you are in a relationship, and what are you going to do? Don't trust anybody. Because you heard that. Right? Don't show that you're weak. Did you ever hear that? Maybe you didn't hear it, but you saw it. And it's just as a powerful communication. If you saw it or you, didn't, or you heard it, it's the same thing. Don't let anybody dominate you. So in my upbringing, I didn't hear, be a jerk to women. I didn't hear that. I'm from Colombia, so we are so, we're very romantic in nature, you know? Like, we like to dance and be romantic and blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit, right? What I saw when I was growing up were guys, seepy seepy, drinking, flirting with every girl, coming home late, and bringing serenatas and calling it a great guy. That's what I saw. And I saw the woman in my life really suffering for that nonsense. Like, really suffering. Yeah, make sense? That's what I saw. So guess what I did when I was growing up? The jerk, seepy seepy, until really late at night, trying to find as many girls as I can, say I'm sorry, and call myself a man. And wow, inspiring. And guess what happened at some point? 
I was right about it. This is the way to do it. So you got to see yours. I don't know what yours are. You got to see yours. I saw that for myself and I became right about it and I created a chaos in my relationship. You know, I'm a, in some degree, a life coach and a business coach. My ex-girlfriends look at this thing and they're like, he's freaking lying. <laughs> the man who I was 20 years ago didn't have the moral grounds to talk about this without creating a lot of context. Make sense? But it came from the past. I'm not beating myself about it. It came from the past. I'm hooked by the past. You are hooked by the past. And I was right about it. So now I'm in a relationship with Manisha, and she's a doctor. So she's a strong woman. She's an ER doctor for Emory. Strong woman. That A. She's going to tell me how it goes, right? And I grew up as a man. I say how it goes. So there's a dance that if I'm right about, we wouldn't be in our relationship. Very interesting thing happened in my relationship with her. She's a successful woman, right? My dad married a successful woman as well. And I lived with them, and I didn't like their relationship. I didn't like how it went. And I started to compare my relationship with her with my relationship with my dad. The past. But I was unwilling to tell her because I felt very vulnerable about it. So I started strategically looking at how do I divorce her. By the way, Sorrel said that we're married. We're not married yet. We just live together, right? But I started to look, how do I move out of this relationship? So I started to look at different strategies, not talking to her, right? Just like the thing you do when you're moving on. But then I took 100% of this whole thing, right? I got to look. What am I being right about? What am I blaming her for? And then I saw that thing with my dad, strong woman. I'm comparing her. I got to tell her. I've got to tell her. And this was hard as hell. I'm going to tell you. This is written, not the way I'm sharing it with you. Sounds like I'm all full powerful about it. When I was telling her, I was like, on diapers, man. I was like, I got to tell you something. Please don't make fun of this. I know things are difficult, but I got to say something that I know is using me and I'm judging you for and it shouldn't have, it shouldn't be between us. It doesn't mean we have to make this work, but I need to share something. So I told her that thing. And she's like, she was very generous. She's like, oh, I get it. I totally get that. And I was like, huh. I didn't have that anymore. It stopped using me. And the relationship took a new turn. And it survived what we were dealing with. Make sense? Your past is a grip on you. And the way that it, you can start loosening up that grip is by sharing it with your significant other. Whatever that is. Whether your significant other is a jerk or not, you've got to share it. And then something else opens up. And when you're being right about something, you've got to notice it. This whole thing about being right, like Sorrel and I were saying, this is what human beings do. This is not going to go anywhere. This is what human beings do. So you got to notice it and then let it go. Does that make sense? Is this opening up something? Yeah, I can, I can feel it in the room. You guys are here now. I can, I can sense it. Very powerful, right? So this is a whole journey. Now, we're going to open up on something else. Another seat for you to take on. For those of you who are not married and you're going to get married, right? Or you're going to live with someone. There are two worlds that are colliding. The world of being single and the world of being married. These are two worlds. And both worlds have a past. They both have an expectation that is running the show in your life, but you don't know what it is. So basically it looks like this. I'm dating you, and there's a way that I behave when I'm dating you. And the moment I get married, nothing changed. The moment I get married, all these expectations show up from what I heard about being married. And then I start becoming the expectation, which is different from the person 
she was dating. Does that make sense? And it happens the other way as well. It is very common to hear someone who's been dating for seven years, they got married and they got divorced the next month. What happened? Something from the past, an expectation. All these rules that showed up that one didn't notice, one didn't talk about, and he couldn't survive the opportunity of the relationship. Make sense? Most of our struggles in, in our relationships come from unfulfilled expectations that other people created for us and we bring them to our relationship. Now, if we were working together, if we were in the course, then we would go and look at that and we'll have a notebook and we'll start looking. So what did I hear? What's using me right now? What's impacting me right now? And we will do the work. Does that make sense? Or are we doing on time? Okay. So I love to hear from someone, or for some of you, what's opening up? What, what do you hear? What are you living with that is kind of like useful for you? Any brave souls? Go ahead. something magical about discovering that you're being right. And you said, he's also being right. And when both rights collide, there's no relationship. And guess what? You now have tremendous power because you've got two things. A, you know you're being right, do you? And for how much of the relationship are you responsible? 100. So now, who gets to get off the dime and create a relationship? So the fact that there's no relationship is only a function of what? You not being 100% responsible for your relationship. Yeah. yeah. And some, of, and some you of you may hear that and say, that's not fair. <laughs> well, life is not fair. It's not fair, it's true, but it's powerful. So what do you want to have? You want to have power, so you want to take that on. It's powerful. Nobody teaches you this. People always teach you 50-50, be right, show them you're right, and they have no relationships to account for. Make sense? Okay, so now I'm going to open up one more thing for those of you who are in business. And this is critical because... This is a powerful seed that we're going to leave with you, a very powerful seed that we hope that you begin to water it as your life goes. This whole aspect of schedule, you know, your schedule and your time and your promises, that's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, it's your whole life. The things that you got to do, the clients you got to see, the promises you got to fulfill, right? And if you're up to a big life, then your schedule should be pretty busy, right? So how do you handle that life, that big life, with having someone in your life and growing that relationship as well? Now, I said this is a seed for you to take on. The way you handle this, it's by including your significant other on the mission or the vision or and the vision of what you're up to. And in some degree, your significant other also creates it with you. 
There is a rule in leadership that when you actually get it, you are able to create high-performing teams around you. People support what they create. So when you include your significant other in the opportunity of your vision, in the opportunity of the mission of what you're up to, and she or he is part of what that mission is, now they also see themselves fulfilling on that mission. What if you don't have the abundance? Because they're not creating it with you. They got to create it with you. You as the leader of your business, there are some things that you got to share. What do you see? What's the impact in the marketplace? How is this changing people's lives? So your partner can see like, oh, okay, this, is, this has a meaning. This is not just you being out there. Now at some point after you're sharing, you got to ask that partner, what would you like it to look like? Because I'm doing this with you. And so when that person really sees that it's safe to give their two cents, now it becomes their mission as well. So now when you have a promise out there in the world with some client, with a prospect, with whatever you're doing, it's not just you who has the promise, the relationship has the promise. And then now you start managing that whole world around a leadership conversation. Not just a couple conversation, a leadership conversation. So I create my mission with my significant other. She's not part of the business, but she is in the business. You know, our mission is to create a new conversation about leadership and a new self-expression for being a leader. And that's also hers. So when I'm here, she's here. And when I go, she doesn't say, well, where are you, what were you doing? It's like, how did it go? Now I'm responsible for not telling her how this didn't work, this didn't work. I don't bring the, the royal mess about that. But every now and then when I share it, I'm being responsible. And she's responsible for how she's hearing it, not me complaining. Make sense? Now most people don't go through that process, but if you do... Now it's different. Now if you're working on Sunday morning, it's not working on Sunday morning. You guys are creating something on Sunday morning. And as you're creating your business and as you're taking your business to the next level, you got to create milestones. Make sense? you got to create actions. It's not like you're telling your significant other your calendar, but he or she gets a sense of the milestones to fulfill on that mission. So now it's the thing you do, and that's the thing she does. It's actually what we do. Does that make sense? Now, this is a seed. You almost have to reinvent yourself to create this. A lot of stuff has to be let go, a lot of bananas. But when you do that, you no longer have a calendar issue. It's not like when you're sitting at dinner and you're like talking about what happened today, and that person is like, oh, you're going to talk about that again. It's like, no, tell me more. Make sense? You begin to surrender to your calendar. Now, these are basic things that make a difference. We're not going to get into them, but we have them here. You got to be consistent in every area. You got to be consistent in talking about that mission with her or with him. And you got to be consistent in sharing those milestones and those actions. You know, like you share at the beginning of the year and then in December you want the relationship to still stay alive. You got to keep doing it. You got to keep taking responsibility, letting the banana constantly go, constantly go back to, I am responsible for the whole thing. You're not responsible for anything. Now that doesn't mean you got to stay in the relationship, but I'm responsible for it. Very good. So we have opened up a big world for you guys, a very big world. So now, one of the things that it's clear is that, go ahead. I'll share something. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Right? As, as we're inviting you to consider being in this course, I can't help but remember how the pricing for what my company offered doubled overnight. 
So here I am, I was being right that as a, as a minority business owner, that the price needed to be what it is so I can stick around and hang on to the contract, right? So I had to give up being right that a minority business must perform at a lower price. Sorry, sir, I missed the context. Why are you sharing about this? I'm sharing about this because I took a course like this. I took this course and giving up being right, seeing the expectations I had actually doubled the price of what we do overnight. So I'm sitting there with our team and the team included my wife and another woman. And I came in with the price proposal. And guess what? I was right about those prices. And I had an expectation that they would simply go, great work, Sorrel. How about them prices? They didn't. <laughs> they actually took what I did and said, you must be crazy. You're giving your work away. Why? And I tell you, I went kicking and screaming. You know what I had to do? Just to get away from being right and the expectation that they should do what I wanted? I had to leave. I left and stood in, darn it, I'm right. These prices need to be that because if they're not that way, we'll get fired. And they're wrong because they're challenging me. So I gave it up. It's not like I gave it up. I, I, I went, okay, you win. Two weeks later, the company responded to proposal and accepted prices that they put together that was double what I was putting together. All of that as a result of, even though I didn't fully give up being right, but I had this information. I knew that if I walked away and took myself out of the situation, being right, and my expectations wouldn't be in the way. So this is not about being perfect. This is about actually having the kinds of tools that can make you effective even when you think all is lost. So this invitation is not casual. It actually does work. So we want to make an invitation for you. So as you heard the conversation and started to open things up, raise your hand if the conversation today made a difference for you. Yeah? So as you started listening to something, things were opening up. Now we just spent an hour and 10 minutes about the conversation. So we're inviting you to consider being part of a three-day conversation where we're going to be opening up a bit more of what uses you as a human being, of what controls you as a human being, what manipulates you as a human being, and it doesn't allow you to be the performer that you want to be in your business and in your relationships. Because have you noticed that the information that you need for your business is not missing? Have you noticed that? Like you know what you need to do? What's missing is actually taking those actions that you know to do. Have you noticed that what's missing is not where to get the information that you don't know that you need? Because you know where to get it, right? But what's missing is actually taking on the actions. So there is something that uses human beings, that controls human beings, that doesn't allow them to be free to actually take the actions that they know to do. And so this course, it's three days because we're going to be visiting three aspects of human beings' lives. We're going to be taking a very deep look at your past. The past has a grip on your future. You don't think it does. You're having a hard time creating a new future. Then we're going to look at that. We're going to dive in and in a, in a kind of way that I am willing to say that most of you have never seen being your past being opened up like that. Then we're going to go into the present. Go ahead. How it actually happens 
is that Giovanni and I will coach you publicly. Like you'll be hanging on to a banana and I'll be right there in your face and I'll go, you're holding on to a banana. And you go, no, I'm not. <laughs> you're hanging on to a banana. No, I'm not. <laughs> and then at some point in time, you look down and you see this big plantain in your hand. And you go like that and something miraculous happens. And it happens over and over and over in the course where your discovery triggers yours. Your discovery triggers yours and it impacts every area of your life. Not just your relationship with yourself, but your relationship with the people in your life and your relationship to your business. So it's not the type of course where you're gonna come and take notes and learn a whole bunch of things. But it's the type of course where you're going to discover your own humanity. And such discovery will leave you more effective in your life than you've ever been. Yeah, and it's the kind of promise that we can do, not because we make crazy promises, because we've seen what people do afterwards. You know? And then there is your past, but then we have to deal with your present. How do you deal with your present, your every day? You know, have you noticed that your brain is talking all the time? And it is like talking you out of things? And it's like telling you that you're not good enough? And that you're not pretty enough? And that you don't know enough? And it's doing all this crazy stuff, right? Have you noticed that? Yeah? Or maybe you... It's doing that right now. So we got to deal with the present in such a way that you have power to deal with your life right there that moment, on that interview, on that prospect. And then finally, the future. Now this is a different spin, because on Sunday, we, we go entrepreneur on you. We're no longer going to be looking at insights that uses you, now we're going to look at business, and how marketing works, and how the psychology of your customers work, and how to actually transform wherever your business is to having more people looking at your business and understanding that process so that you can grow a business. Now we're going to go business on you. And then the other big deal, a very big thing, is that in the process you're putting the puzzle together so that your self-expression as a leader has a new ability to be fulfilled because we're going to talk about how to create high-performing teams around you. You know, by yourself, there's only so much you can do. And you know it, right? I'm not telling you something new. But when you create teams, high-performing teams around you, that's when life becomes fun. And, you, and that's not like intuitively. That's actually strategic. You've got to know how to do it. It's not intuitively. Intuitively doesn't work. You know, I go to most companies, right? Most companies have a very intuitive way of doing customer service. Intuitive ways like just be nice. That's intuitive. Well, of course, being nice works. But how many people are being nice? You know, it's do what you do unto others, what you want them to do unto you. That's very intuitively. You know, almost everybody knows. And then yet we go into a company and they're not necessarily doing that. Does that make sense? In the opportunity of growing your leadership, you got to start, you want to start looking at shying a little bit away from just being intuitive, to also being strategic. And we want to make sure that you have those strategies that we use for companies. So and the three days are structured that way. Because guess what? You can go anywhere, Google, YouTube, and get tons and tons of information on how to market your business more effectively, how to operate and cut costs. There's no you know, dearth of business knowledge out there. But here's the deal. People go to school, people go to YouTube, people go to Google, but guess what? They're still being right. And they're still hanging on to their expectations. So the first two days are critical because who you are as a human being, I don't care how much knowledge you accumulate, your success will be limited in a world where you are right and you hang on to the banana, and you fight for it. So it's structured in a way that's very different from other courses, 
and it's the most effective way for a human being not to learn, but to transform into a Yes. So one of the things that it includes is 30 years of experience, a little bit more, of leadership training. Whenever you go to any course, this is to this kind of level, you usually are going to pay around $5,000. I know because I've led those courses. I know because I have paid for those courses. And it also includes five group coaching webinars after the course. So after the course, we're not just going to say, hey, goodbye, have a good time. You actually will have five webinars where we'll all be together to keep enforcing and growing the muscle of whatever you learn, whatever we grew up in. So the cost of the course is 15, the value of the course is $5,500. Now, these are some of the people that have attended our courses, some of the impact that they've had on their businesses, right? This is Angela, this is a friend and also a client from a few years where we were able to help her business grow to where it is. Steven Rosenthal, he's an MD and a cardiologist, and this is what he says about our work. Also, Santiago was able, Santiago is actually the president and CEO of the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And he attended one of our events, and this is what he had to say about our event, about our conversation. And this is a real close friend of mine and also a client who is Rita Williams, and then she's an um, owner of a law firm where she said that this was a billion dollar seminar on leadership, is what I call ALW, Access the Leader Within Breakthrough Seminar. From the beginning to the end, it was extraordinary. The topics and the content elevated my thinking on relationships and leadership. My attendance is a must. Though if you know anything about her, you know that she does a lot of growth and development. She didn't just say that. Very good. So those are some of our testimonials. And then we want to give you this opportunity, and we want to make an offer that you just don't want to refuse. You don't want to let it go. Until February 25th, if you register be before that, the cost of the course is going to be $297. And if you do it before February 25th, you can bring somebody with you. Now, we're committed that you bring someone with you because your transformation in your life, your effectiveness in your life doesn't happen by yourself. It happens in community. So we want you to bring as many people in your life so that you can have the transformation together, so that you can both let go of the bananas. Yeah, and now is the opportunity to choose to be in the course. I'm inviting you personally. I may not know you. I know you. <laughs> I may not know you, but I'm telling you firsthand what this is worth. It's worth your time. Uh, Giovanni and I love doing this, and we'd love to do it with you. So the opportunity is there. We have a few people we want to introduce. Fabiola and Fabienne, uh, Gabby, Lorna, Maxime, and Levy. Yes. No, I, and I want to add something. Yeah. And for those of you who are looking at this online, you just have to go to the link below, and you can go ahead and register. And if this is up, you can still take advantage also of this opportunity.